So it's, I used to call this lecture um, MR of the foot, and I uh, gave it to several podiatrists, and I said that that's not correct. The foot begins at show parts joint, and this is actually the forefoot, which is why we call it the forefoot. And as opposed to an ankle MRI, which I think to this day is still my favorite examination of all, um, a foot is a much more focused examination, and therefore I think a little bit easier to master. There are in 30 different diseases, and that in marrow alone, like you have in the ankle. In the foot, you have about seven or eight diseases, and three of them are seen in about 80% of your patients. And those three are going to be sesamoid problems, Morton's neuromas, and synovitis of its various aspects. To me, those are about 80% of foot MRI. So we're going to cover disorders of the sesamoids, Morton's neuromas, in particular recurrent Morton's neuromas, tendon disorders and synovitis, and if we have time, AVN, marrow, and plantar plate disorders. We're going to begin with the sesamoid, and we're going to talk a little bit about sesamoid anatomy. It is not that complicated, but it bears repetition. The sesamoids are part of the hallux joint. Therefore, they are within the joint capsule. And any disorders of the joint will be seen and seen on a magnified basis within the sesamoid. Therefore, one important cause of sesamoid abnormal imaging characteristics is various articular diseases, most notably osteoarthritis. And if I see mistakes on outside cases that I get for consultation in the foot, the two major mistakes is to overcall a disorder of, as an intrinsic disorder of the sesamoid when it's really articular disease. And the second major mistake I see in consultation is people overcalling masses when it's really adventitial bursitis. And we're going to talk about both of those issues um, soon. Rather than saying medial and lateral sesamoids, the preferred term is tibial and fibula. Attaching the sesamoids is an intersesamoid ligament. Between the sesamoids on the metatarsal head is a little spicule bone called the crister. And plantar to the sesamoids lies the flexahalysis longus. This was a professional football player. And we see the flexahalysis has belotted up and is now separating out the tibial from the fibula sesamoid because there's an intersesamoid ligament rupture. The intersesamoid ligament is what keeps the sesamoids together. And if you notice, when you have hallux valgus, the two sesamoids almost always shift as a unit. When they do not shift as a unit, that's an intersesamoid ligament rupture. Like everything in radiology, there are normal variants. The most important normal variant is low signal within a sesamoid. This can be diffuse, but is usually epicentered at the plantar aspect or only seen at the plantar aspect. And if you volume average through this, it can make you think that there's AVN or sesamoiditis. When it really is as a normal variant, I believe is chronic stress changes with thickening of the cortex. And this is an example of it. Um, a lot of technologists and radiologists disagree about what this plane is called. So in order to l minimize the confusion, I always call this the short axis plane. So who, who has a problem with whether this is the coronal or the axial plane? Yeah, hopefully everyone would raise their hand because I think all radiologists call this the coronal plane and all technologists call this the axial plane, at least in every institution I've ever worked. So I call this the short axis plane or the cucumber slice plane in order so we have clarity about what we're talking about. But if you look at this, this is the anatomy. This is the metatarsal head. This is the crista, which is the spicule bone that separates out the tibial sesamoid from the fibula sesamoid. Deep or plantar to the sesamoids lies the FHL, and then dorsal to the FHL lies, lies the intersesamoid ligament. And around this entire structure, including the FHL, is the joint capsule. And you can see that black line of the joint capsule. But I show this slide not for a point of anatomy, but to show you the plantar low signal in the sesamoids. And that is a normal variant, or at least an asymptomatic variant. This is another example of it, and this is much more florid. If we look on a T1-weighted image, we see no normal marrow in either sesamoid. And on a T2-weighted image, we continue to see no normal marrow. That is 
hypertrophy, in my personal opinion, from chronic stress. I don't know if it's normal or not, but I am quite convinced that it is asymptomatic. You can also have absence of the sesamoid. Most commonly, that is surgical. It is not an unusual procedure to remove the sesamoid. In fact, most of the disorders we talk about that are recalcitrant to medical therapy, the treatment is just take it out, just remove the sesamoid. The sesamoids also can be congenitally absent. When they are congenitally absent, you do not have a normal crystal. So the way you tell a congenitally absent sesamoid from a surgically removed sesamoid is look for the crystal. And all normal people, whether postoperative or not, should have this spicular bone called the crystal. When the crystal is absent, that means it's a congenitally absent sesamoid rather than a surgically removed sesamoid. A somewhat busy slide, but one point or several points I want to make about this is number one is I call sesamoidologists now almost never. I reserve it for cases that really do not fit any other diagnosis and only when it involves both sesamoids. I think you should struggle for an alternative diagnosis for a sesamoid disorder rather than using sesamoiditis. I think at this point, sesamoiditis is relatively archaic. When evaluating the sesamoids, to tell what is wrong with the sesamoids, there are several important concepts. Number one is you want to see what the edema looked like on a T1-weighted image. And now I'm going to emphasize this in my afternoon talk on marrow and in my workshop on ankle marrow. The key or the single most important concept when evaluating marrow is not to only look at a fat suppressed image, to look at a T1-weighted image. That T1-weighted image will give you a window into the severity of the marrow disorder and will also limit your differential diagnosis because, for example, AVN should always be strikingly abnormal on T1. If you only see edema and the T1 is not strikingly abnormal, whether it's the sesamoid or any other bone in your body, that is not AVN. If I only see the edema on a T2-weighted image and I see nothing on a T1-weighted image, that's mild edema, that's reactive edema, and that's probably articular disease. So the first concept about the sesamoids is look at a T1-weighted image. Do not get a proton density image. Get a T1-weighted image because you want a window into what the marrow looks like on a true T1. The second is look at a long axis image. See if you see a line in a sesamoid. Sesamoid fractures are always in the coronal plane. Consequently, you will never or almost never see them on a short axis image. You either, either need a long axis image or a, what I prefer, a sagittal image to see them. So you want to look at a T1 then you'll want to look on a long axis image and see if you see a line. If you see a line, it could be a fracture or it could be a bipartite sesamoid. And if there is edema in a bipartite sesamoid, we'll talk about this in my ankle marrow workshop, that's a sign of a breakdown of the synchondrosis. So within this busy slide, the kernels that are important is AVN should be more overtly seen on a T1-weighted image. Forget the rules in the textbooks about tibial versus fibular sesamoid. They don't work in real life. Reserve the term sesamoiditis for rare patients and only when both sesamoids are involved. Look on your long axis images for a line. Distinguish if it's a bipartite sesamoid or a fracture line and then make your diagnosis. So in this patient, is one more important point about the sesamoids. Here is the fibrillar sesamoid, here is the crista. There is little to no normal marrow signal on a T1-weighted image. That tells me that this could be AVN or it could just be severe marrow edema. And sure enough, we see marrow edema on the inversion recovery image. But what makes you make this diagnosis is the kissing changes you see in the adjacent metatarsal head. The majority of mistakes I've made and I've seen make in a sesamoids is overcalling a sesamoid disorder that is really articular disease. And all this is is articular disease. And you know it's articular disease because even in, this is an obvious example, 
But even if the example was much less obvious, and I saw only a tiny bit of edema here, I can tell you in my experience that is almost always OA. Now again, I like to reserve sesamoiditis for rare circumstances, but both sesamoids must have abnormal signal, and here you can see the edema on an inversion recovery sequence. Another example of sesamoiditis. Again, I would say the number of times I've used this diagnosis in the last three years is probably only one or two. I really very rarely use it. When five years ago, I would say half of all sesamoid cases that I read, I used it. And it's not because the disease is changing, it's because I was making a lot more mistakes. Another patient, the tibial sesamoid is involved. Here is the crista, the fibula sesamoid is normal. We see this is overt on a T1-weighted image. It doesn't matter what it looks like on a T2-weighted image. All that matters is that there is something wrong with it on a T2-weighted image. And the more overt it is on a T1-weighted image, the more likely it is to be necrosis. This is an interesting case. So this is a patient who has relatively subtle edema here on the inversion recovery sequence. If we look on a T1, only the medialmost portion of the sesamoid is abnormal. They come back two years later. They have greater marrow edema, both on T1 and on inversion recovery. Still no kissing changes in a metatarsal head. If this is a fracture, it would have healed or gone on to a non-union. It's not a bipartite sesamoid. So again, another example of avascular necrosis. One last thing about AVN is AVN can lead to fracture lines, to fragmentation. And the way you distinguish the fracture lines you see in AVN or the fragmentation you see in AVN from a fracture is look at that sagittal image for that coronally oriented line. Sesamoid fractures have a constant coronally oriented fracture line. Fragmentation from avascular necrosis is not always coronally oriented. And this is an example of it. Another tibial sesamoid edematous on a short axis image of note the joint effusion and we go to a sagittal image we see fragmentation and separation with the coronally oriented fracture line. That should be distinguished from a bipartite sesamoid. Here the fibula sesamoid is abnormal, the tibial sesamoid is normal. And if we compare the two parts of that fibula sesamoid, even when put together, they are bigger than the tibial sesamoid. And if we look at this fracture line, this is more obliquely oriented than a typical fracture line seen in um, traumatic or stress-related sesamoid fractures. And this is a breakdown of the synchondrosis. And if you go to my ankle marrow workshop, I'll talk about this in detail because the concept is transferable over all different bones in your body. So I, in my experience, about 30% of foot disorders are of the sesamoids in the three places that I practice. Another 30% are Morton's. Now, we often image Morton's postoperatively, a little less commonly, we image them preoperatively, but I think it's important to begin with preop. This is a mistake. It should be third and fourth interspace. One thing about Morton's is that they are not infrequently asymptomatic. And do not be bashful about calling these, I would say, in 40% of the foot MRIs that you read. I think if you don't call them in 40% of adult foot MRIs, you're undercalling them because I think about 80% of them are asymptomatic. And just because you have a Morton's does not mean that you are, um, that is the cause of your symptoms. There was an orthopedic surgeon who came up to me at a course we were doing on a spine last week, and he was sure he had a Morton's neuroma. We MR'd his foot, and he had a Morton's neuroma. He's an orthopedic surgeon. And it turns out that he had a, a synovial cyst in his knee pushing on his tibial nerve and giving him foot neuropathy. And when he injected his synovial cyst of his knee, his Morton's neuroma symptoms went away. So incidental Morton's neuromas are not uncommon, okay? They can be very small, and again, in my experience, the size is not directly relatable to symptoms. Certainly the big ones are almost always symptomatic, but the little ones can be symptomatic. I like to give IV contrast for this diagnosis. I don't think it is necessary. Again, this is a diagnosis best made on T1-weighted images because you want to see the contrast between the Morton's neuroma 
and the plant off flat. You don't want to do a proton density because it will minimize that contrast. On plain film, you see Sullivan sign, which is a standing film where you see splaying of the toes. The patient's trying to decompress their foot with the pain. Very classic plain film of a Morton's neuroma. Normally, when you're looking at a short axis view, at the level of the distal metatarsals, the fat forms a triangle that goes up in between the intermetatarsal space. So here is that normal triangle. If you do not have that normal triangle, you have a Morton's neuroma. And it can be very subtle and very small. This is a lecture, so I'm going to show you a large one. But this is 2 or 3% of the Morton's neuromas that we see. Most of the time, they are quite small. If you give contrast, they usually, and that is usually, not always, enhance fairly intensely. So if they do enhance intensely, like you're seeing in this patient, it is most definitively a Morton's neuroma. If they don't enhance, it still probably is a Morton's neuroma. Another patient, if you look, the fat forms a little triangle going up at the distal metatarsals. Another triangle at the distal metatarsals. Here we see a large dumbbell lesion, not bright on T2, at least only slightly bright on T2, and intensely enhancing. The major differential in terms of imaging is intermetatarsal bursitis. Unfortunately, these can be seen concomitantly fairly frequently. So you'll see a Morton's neuroma and then dorsal to the neuroma will lie a little bit of intermetatarsal bursitis. Here is where a T2-weighted image is important because although most Morton's neuromas don't have to be dark on T2, they should not be fluid-like. And if you see a fluid-like area in between the metatarsal heads, that is an intermetatarsal bursitis. And if you make note, most small Morton's neuromas are in a plantar aspect of the interspace. Only when they're big do they extend more dorsally. And when they're big, the differential diagnosis is not difficult at all. We're going to talk about synovitis a little bit, and hopefully we'll get to postoperative Morton's neuromas. Synovitis is a very important finding to look for because it is a very good marker for something wrong with the joint. This is true everywhere in the body, and the foot is no different. What is important to understand is that the presence of fluid does not equal synovitis. Again, true for any joint. It's excessive fluid that makes you diagnose, diagnosis of synovitis. If we're just dealing with the distal forefoot, that is the metatarsal phalangeal joints and distally, there is only one joint that has physiologic fluid, and that's the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. If any other joint has more than a sliver of fluid, that is synovitis. And the way you diagnose it as having more than a sliver of fluid is look on a sagittal view for distension of the dorsal recesses. On a sagittal view, you will see this is the dorsal recess that gets distended. And we can see this on a short axis view, but you see it better on a sagittal view. So if there's any fluid in the joint more than a sliver, that is synovitis. The exception to that is the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Unfortunately, that's the joint where articular disease is most common. So the way I tell if there's synovitis at the first MTP is cheating. I see if I see articular disease, because it's pretty easy to see it. If I see articular disease, I see some fluid, I call it synovitis. If I see fluid in any other joint, distal to the Liz Frank joint. It's synovitis no matter how much I see. Now let's go back to the Liz Frank joint. Liz Frank joint should have very little fluid there normally. And the fluid will volume average in little interstices between these very complex connections of the bones. So if you see fluid in that joint that at all catches your eye, that's Liz Frank joint synovitis and very limited differential. Lisfranc joint trauma, always exclude that. 
osteoarthritis of the lisp branch joint and rheumatoid arthritis. So if you're in doubt, you can give contrast. Again, since I moved to New York, I'm giving contrast much less frequently. But this is a situation where you'd want to give contrast because this volume of fluid, and this is a contrast enhanced image, could easily be physiologic. But if we look at this image, there is marked enhancement here. And you have four internal controls, or at least three internal controls on this image telling you that this enhancement is disproportionate to any other joint. And therefore, this is synovitis, and it's happened to be a plant or plate injury as well as a degenerative intersesamoid ligament rupture. We see this splaying at the sesamoid. Now, to reiterate the point of anatomy I brought up, that the joint capsule comes down here, and the FHL is within the joint capsule, we see how this synovitis encompasses the FHL. That distal FHL is in the joint capsule of the first MTP. Here's a patient with synovitis of the second and third metatarsophalangeal joints. This also happens to be a contrast enhanced image, but even if it wasn't, this volume of fluid is abnormal. The next thing we're going to talk about in the foot is avascular necrosis. You see this all the time on plane films in the second metatarsal. Now, whether that's truly spontaneous or not, I'll leave for a different debate, but we'll call it spontaneous for the purpose of this lecture. We don't image those people. They may, but usually are not symptomatic when we take their radiographs. One important thing to remember about AVN, it is a common complication of hallux valgus repairs. And when you're imaging someone with a hallux valgus repair, I would spend 50% of my time looking for infection and 50% of my time looking for AVN because those are going to be your only two diagnoses. So AVN, very common following hallux valgus repair. We see AVN following fractures. It's common in other parts of the body, but in the foot, the only place you see that is following Jones fractures of the fifth metatarsal base. The last thing about AVN, and if you go to Dr. Moore's workshop on a diabetic foot this afternoon, I'm sure she will cover this. It is not unusual at all to see infarcts in a diabetic foot that were unrecognized prior to imaging them, and you're imaging them for possible osteomyelitis. I would say you see that about 5 to 10% of the cases of diabetic feet, and it's a pretty common thing in a diabetic foot. If you happen to MR a person with Freiburg's, this is what you'll see. Again, this is not articular disease because we see no kissing changes in a proximal phalanx. We only see changes in the metatarsal head and the characteristic flattening one sees with Freiburg's infarction. This is a patient who had a hallux valgus repair. We see this crescentic area of low signal on a T1-weighted image. It almost looks cystic on a T2-weighted image, but the changes are basically only on a metatarsal side. As we'll talk about this afternoon in my marrow talk, we'll go through the differential diagnosis of a crescent on MR. But you probably all know based upon Dr. Rafi's lecture, that a crescent is a fairly characteristic but not pathognomonic sign of AVN. And again, if you image someone following a hallux valgus repair, half are infected or half have AVN, those who have a complication. I have a, a little blurb about callus when imaging in the foot. And every time I show this, I jump back a little bit and I think, you know, why am I including this in MR of the foot? The reason why I'm including this is callus on imaging, at least on MR imaging, can look really scary looking, like a tumor or a rheumatoid nodule or something very bad. And I include it just so that you see it and recognize it. It's always low on T1. It has variable T2, but is never fluid-like on T2. But the scary thing is if you happen to give contrast, it enhances like a light bulb, like a light bulb, like a tumor. Very, very scary. And the way you tell callus from something you worry about is just take off your shoe and look at your foot and see where you have calluses on your foot. You have them underneath the second metatarsal head, 
underneath and slightly lateral to the fifth metatarsal head. And if you're like me and you have an early hallux valgus, you have a medial to the first MTP. So you look at those areas, and if you see it in those areas, that's callus. Now, I'm not talking about the ankle, but for sake of completeness, you also get a callus right underneath the calcaneus, right by the plantar fascia. If you look carefully, probably about a half of the exams you image have this. Now, it doesn't strike you because you don't give gadolinium, but if you give gadolinium, they get really scary looking. So here is one, a short axis T1 weighted image, big mass, plantar, and lateral to the first metatarsal. Again, think about your own foot. That's where you have a callus. I do a fat suppressed T2 weighted image, and it's not that bright on T2, but it's bright enough to be scary. And we do a contrast image, enhanced image, and it lights up like a light bulb. And that is just skin callus. You want to distinguish that from a true tumor because this patient, almost the exact same location, almost the exact same signal characteristics, right? Yes. This happens to be a rheumatoid nodule. It could be a liposarcoma. It could be an MFH. It could be a synovial sarcoma. It doesn't matter. The location is what tells you this is nowhere near the metatarsal head. We are at the mid-metatarsal. This patient, it's the metatarsal head. So when you're thinking of callus, either in your imagination or if you're in a room alone, take off your shoe and look where you have callus, and that's where it's going to be. Imaging characteristics can be really scary, and that's why I include it in this talk. We talked about synovitis, and bursitis is a related entity, except it occurs obviously not in the joint, but in the bursa. We divide bursa into those that everyone has, so-called anatomic bursa, and those that are acquired, and we use the term adventitial for these acquired bursa. In the foot, it's easy. They're all acquired. They're all adventitial. So if you see any fluid collections, that may be an adventitial bursa. Now, I mostly bring this up because this is another thing that's very worrisome, and I'll show you this case. So this case was sent to me by a former fellow. This was the CEO of his hospital who had this scan, and they called this a synovial sarcoma, and they wanted to do a foot amputation. This was in some small town. Um, I, can, I used to live in Pennsylvania, so I'll say in Pennsylvania. Uh, so he sent me the scan, and interestingly enough, he has a bipartite sesamoid, with edema on both parts of the sesamoid, early breakdown of that synchondrosis. But this is a classic adventitial bursa that occurs in the plantar aspect of the foot. And where bursa occur are the same points where callus occurs. That's why we just talked about callus before bursa. These are points of friction. Callus is one way your body responds to friction. Adventitial bursa is another way you respond to friction. I suggested that this was an adventitial bursa. They ended up aspirating it. Cytology was negative, and it was consistent with inflammatory synovial fluid, so we were safe. This is a more scary case because we gave contrast. And just like when you give contrast for skin calluses, they can become scary. When you give it for bursa, because they are chronically inflamed and chronically bleeding into them, they can become scary. So if we look here, we see a fluid collection. Again, this is the level of the metatarsal head. When we give contrast, we see thick rim enhancement around this. Now, one note I want to bring up about giving contrast here is who has switched to uh, rapid gradient echo images as opposed to T1-weighted images following contrast? Can I just see a show of hands? Not that many people. Well, I have. And one thing you have to be aware of is since the images are so fast, you may miss enhancement. So when you do that, you always get a delayed image after you get three or four contrast enhanced images because you may completely miss enhancement of a structure which is enhancing because the images are so fast. So just one caveat about that. This happens to be an old-fashioned T1 fat suppressed image. And what you see is this thick rim of enhancement. Could be an abscess 
could be an necrotic tumor. When it's underneath the sesamoid, that tells you that this is one of these classic adventitial bursa. And again, this is sesamoid arthritis with kissing changes at the sesamoid and the metatarsal head. Okay. In the last three minutes, I want to cover one thing, and the reason why I'm skipping to this is I think it's an important cause of cryptic foot pain. And one thing I've always had trouble on imaging is to see what's not there rather than what's there and is abnormal. And denervation injuries are one of those things where it's hard to see what's there versus what's that there because you'll see atrophy of the muscles. It can be either the medial aspect of the foot with medial plantar nerve or less commonly the lateral aspect of the foot. And these patients come in with a whole bunch of different symptoms, Ruat Morton's, Ruat Sesamoid, muscle tear, even diabetic foot, but early diabetic, somewhat unusual. Those are kind of the three things that you see. And what you see here is a short axis T1, a short axis fat suppressed T2. If you looked at this image, you would say nothing was abnormal. But in the fat suppressed image, you have complete fatty atrophy of the adductor hallucis. And that is medial plantar nerve denervation causing complete fatty replacement of that muscle. Another example, adductor digiti minimi, lateral plantar nerve denervation. And again, you see this, I would say, in 3 to 4% of foot MRIs. It's very common and is in there in my way of looking at an exam saying, I have to check this at the end because this is an important cause of cryptic foot pain. So in the last half hour, we did a focused examination of MR of the foot. I think MR of the foot is not that hard because there's only four or five different diagnoses to make. I went through certain rules about those diagnoses. I said, always get a short axis image and a long axis image. Don't get PD images. Get T1 weighted images because we want to see fat both in marrow and to make sure there's not a mortens. We talked about the major disorders of the foot which are of the sesamoids, and rarely use the term sesamoiditis, and a Morton's neuroma, and don't be bashful about calling these in many, many patients, because we all know that they're gonna be symptomatic. And again, I wanna apologize, I intentionally selected the foot to speak about, not the ankle, because I wanted this course to be different than last year, and to talk about a little bit more detailed things that some of you may be somewhat less familiar with.